I didn't have the good fortune of knowing Matilda White Riley, uh, but one thing that's readily apparent when you look her up is what, a, what an impressive person she was. She had, in essence, multiple distinguished careers. First as an academic, she authored, I believe, 16 books. She was a university professor at Rutgers. She was the first full professor at Bowdoin, who was a female. Uh, and then at age 68, she came to NIH and really, over the next 20 years, spearheaded a lot of very important new initiatives around social and behavioral science and research at NIH, uh, to which I think we all owe a debt of gratitude uh, for her really laying the foundation and giving us the opportunities to try to make a difference through our, through our own work. I also want to thank Richard Sussman. Uh, Richard, of course, is a person who's familiar to all of you, and I did have the good fortune of, of getting to know Richard over the years. And he was a, there are many things one, one could say about Richard in terms of his contributions. I, I want to just highlight how, how, how helpful he was to us when we were starting out in this field. And he was relentless in his encouragement of behavioral economics and health research and really, I think, encouraged many of the people in the field to get galvanized and really think about how their work could be helpful in terms of improving health and health behavior. And he really, uh, you know, I guess relentless is probably a, a good word to emphasize. I, I remember many times getting emails from him at <laughs> one in the morning, uh, and I just thought, well, he, he really has a lot of energy. Uh, <laughs> But at any rate, you know, we're, we're all very grateful to Richard and, and for all of his efforts to really try to help grow and build this field so that we can have more impact in terms of improving the health of not only Americans, but, but people worldwide. So where I'm going to start uh, my talk is really by highlighting a, what I think is going to be a major shift in how Healthcare is financed in the US because I think this is going to have profound implications for social behavioral science research in terms of creating new opportunities to have more impact in the future. And in essence, uh, many of you may be familiar with this announcement that was made by the Health and Human Services Secretary, Sylvia Burwell, a few months ago. But for the first time, CMS set explicit goals for the proportion of Medicare payment that's going to be shifting from fee-for-service to various different types of mechanisms in which, in essence, there's, there's responsibility for the health of populations of people. And to summarize, with one of the quotes that came with this release was that in alternative payment models, providers are accountable for the quality and cost of the services, people, and populations they serve, moving away from the old way of doing things, which amounted to the more you do, the more you get paid. And I think the motivation for this, a lot of it comes from these types of international comparisons where, as you know, we spend a lot more than any other country on health services, but we don't rank very well when it comes to various metrics of population health. So for example, in this Commonwealth Fund study, one can see compared to other Western European countries in Australia, we actually rank near the bottom on a number of health indices which is obviously not, not where we'd like to be. And a lot of this probably does have to do with behavior. We know that we have very high rates of obesity in our population. Smoking remains the leading cause of preventable mortality, killing about 430,000 Americans per year. And a very large portion of healthcare spending is believed to be tied to various diseases where behavior plays a very large role. People have tried to estimate how much of premature mortality in the US is due to health behavior choices. And it's very hard to know what these percentages are because there's very complicated attribution issues. But the running, the, I think the most commonly used estimate is 40% of premature mortality is due to behavior, which really highlights both that there are enormous challenges here and enormous opportunities. So in studying motivation, what's become very clear to us is that we've been on a very interesting journey. For a long time, 
and I think this is still very much true in clinical practice today in the US, the modal approach is to give people information and assume that if you give people information, they'll know what to do with it. And I think that's partly true, but information in some sense helps to address knowledge deficits. It doesn't necessarily address behavior deficits. So for example, when you look at smokers and what do they know about the risk of smoking, it's pretty clear that smokers in general understand that smoking causes cancer of various kinds, smoking causes heart disease. That information alone is often not enough to get them to change their behavior. Perhaps as a result, there's been a shift towards using standard economics in a lot of different ways to try to influence behavior. We've seen in the last several years a huge growth in employers' use of incentives for health behavior. About 85% of large employers in the US now use incentives for health behavior of one kind or another. The problem with a lot of these programs is they're really couched with, from the lens of standard economics. And in essence, are assuming that people are perfectly rational. They're able to calculate the risks and benefits of their actions now and in the future, and then through some process of backwards induction, figure out which set, of which set of choices has the highest net present value. And unfortunately, most people don't make decisions that way. It's become increasingly clear that people tend to be predictably irrational. What's good about this, in a sense, is that it is predictable uh, what sort of decision errors people tend to make. They tend to focus much more on the present than the future. They're very susceptible to framing how choices are framed. They're much more influenced by losses than by potential gains. They're influenced heavily by how they feel as opposed to deliberative cognitive processes. They're very influenced by what people around them do. And they're also very influenced by the choices that are put in front of them, how many choices there are, what order they appear in, what the defaults are. And all of this is a much richer texture for thinking about descriptively about human behavior but it also has very important normative implications in terms of thinking about how one might design interventions so that they work in terms of trying to help humans change their behavior. We've thought a lot about what types of decision errors can be helpful in terms of improving program design, and these are just a few of them. One of the most important is the notion that people have what are called present bias preferences. So they're much more affected by the immediate costs and benefits of their actions than the future consequences. And this is very important because a lot of programs are designed so that they do things like give people feedback at the end of this year. But of course, if it's a cold day in January and you're trying to decide whether to go to the gym today, the prospect of getting a reward at the end of December isn't very motivating. And you have to figure out how do you make feedback much more frequent, much more immediate? Another very big issue is the framing and segregating of rewards. So we know from a mental accounting standpoint that people process uh, flows of money very differently depending on how they're packaged, how they're bundled. So for example, if we give somebody a $100 discount off their health insurance premium, that gets added to their paycheck. It's electronically deposited in the bank. And in essence, you've made $100 pretty invisible. Whereas if you hand somebody $100, then even if they're a high income person, they will notice that. Overweighting of small probabilities is very important. We know people are notoriously bad at estimating probabilities, particularly probabilities near zero. A lot of this relates to the popularity of lotteries in the United States. Americans spend about $72 billion a year of their own money on lotteries, partly because they think the likelihood of winning is much larger than it actually is. But instead of using this to take advantage of people, you can use similar approaches in terms of trying to improve engagement and health improvement programs. And I'll give you some examples of, of how we've done that. We also know people are very aversive to regret. They're very loss averse. These are both very important principles that can be built into program design. And people have what's called a very strong status quo bias, uh, meaning that they will tend to choose the default, the path of least resistance. And that can be very useful as well in terms of helping people improve their health. So this is a, a very famous example that was published by Eric Johnson, who's at Columbia, uh, and Noah, Noah Goldstein in Science a number of years ago. And it's a simple description of the rate at which people sign up for organ donor registries in different Western European countries. They made the observation 
that the countries in left in yellow are all countries which have an opt-in for organ donation. The countries in the right in gray are all countries that have an opt-out. And you can see that the difference here in sign-up rates are enormous. The really the key difference, of course, is that the countries in the left, you have to actually decide to, to join and opt in. The countries in the right, you're presumed to be in unless you explicitly opt out. And this really opened a lot of people's eyes because it's hard to imagine too many interventions where you can have an effect size this large. One of the questions it raised, though, is whether people really recognize they could opt out. Because when you have a percentage that's very close to 100%, it raises the question of whether it felt to people more like a mandate as opposed to a default. My colleague, Scott Halpern, recently led a study which looked at this in a very different kind of setting, where the recognition was that at, in terms of end-of-life care, uh, as, as we know, care often tends to be overly aggressive. And what he did is he randomized people with terminal diseases of the chest, such as metastatic lung cancer, to three different types of advanced directives, a comfort-oriented plan of care, a standard advanced directive in which the provider or patient's family could later choose, or a life extension default. And it was very interesting what he found. 77% of the time, people randomized the comfort-oriented plan of care, in fact, chose a comfort-oriented plan of care. 43% of the time, those randomized to a life extension default actually overrode that and chose a comfort-oriented plan of care. And part of the reason why this study was conducted was really to see, you know, in high-stakes decisions like this, do defaults actually work? Because uh, you could imagine people would have very strongly held preferences. And I think what this highlights, if you think about all the conversations that happen each day between clinicians and patients and hospitals around the US, is that people do respond to the suggestive power of how a clinician frames a decision. And if the clinician frames it a certain way, people will choose that, that choice at very high rates, uh, even in a very high stakes area like this. Here's another example of how you can think about defaults. There are lots of opportunities with the proliferation of electronic medical records to think about how we improve value in healthcare. And this was some work led by one of our, our former fellows, Mitesh Patel, where he looked at generic prescribing rates across our health system, our health system being the Penn Health System, and looked at the impact of changing to an opt-out default. And you can see these generic prescribing rates are all over the map. This is a nice example where you can imagine we can improve value without any appreciable downside because generics tend to be equivalent to brands since they're cheaper, people actually take them at higher rates, so there's some evidence that people who are prescribed generics actually do better in terms of their health because adherence rates are higher. And here's what he found. Pretty instantaneously, the rate of generic prescribing went to 100%, with one notable exception, which is important, which is uh, Synthroid is the, is the exception. And Synthroid is well known among clinicians to the generic forms tend to have variable rates of absorption. And so it was very important that clinicians were able to appreciate here that these are not equivalent. And in the case of somebody with well-controlled thyroid disease, keeping them on the brand made sense. There's also cases, though, where it's not as simple as thinking about putting a default in place, opt-out default, and, and then assuming everything will take care of itself. This is some work we did with CVS where the underlying problem was they had designed an automatic refill program for people on lots of medications. And they had hoped that people would sign up for this in droves because it would be obvious that it'd be more convenient if you're on 10 prescriptions to have the prescriptions arrive by themselves every 90 days as opposed to having to remember each time to reorder the refills. And what they found was they had set it up as an opt-in program, and the rates at which people signed up were much lower than they had hoped. So they asked us what they might do about it. The obvious first question was, could you do this as an opt-out default? And they said, no, we can't. Every time one of these prescriptions goes out, we have to charge people's credit cards. People are going to be very upset with those charges if they haven't explicitly authorized them. So what we did is we embedded within the refill process 
an active choice, simply an opportunity for people to decide, yes, I want to do this, no, I don't. And we further enhance that by highlighting some of the salient aspects in terms of convenience in signing up for the program. So on the bottom left, press 1 if you prefer to refill your prescriptions by yourself each time. Press 2 if you'd prefer for us to do it for you automatically. So you can think about this as a fairly gentle nudge. It more than doubled the rate at which people signed up for the program. CVS now uses this pretty widely throughout their business. And I think the, the nice feature about it is it reflects a choice people actually made to participate as opposed to something they were defaulted into. And for activities that require ongoing engagement, that's probably pretty important. So moving to incentives, there's, you know, all of us are part of, I hope, uh, a health insurance plan. And a health insurance plan, in essence, is like a giant incentive plan that is trying to steer you to use more or less of different kinds of healthcare services. But unfortunately, a lot of these plans are very complicated. And this is an example of uh, one such plan where there's 20 to 25 pages like this of small print. And in essence, what we and others have found is that plan designs are way too complicated. I probably didn't need to tell any of you that. Uh, but there's a veritable alphabet soup of different financial levers that are being put in play, often simultaneously, to try to influence utilization. And patients typically don't understand many of these aspects of plan design. So for example, coinsurance and deductibles, people really struggle with when people are asked to try to calculate how much an episode of care would cost. Uh, we found people are only able to do it about 11% of the time. And so the, the challenge here is that we're putting in place all these plans and we're hoping to use them to guide choices, but people by and large don't really understand the provisions that, that are really intended to, to influence what we choose. So one of the interesting opportunities we had was to do some examination of what people understood and what people didn't, and then work with Humana to design a new plan called Humana Simplicity. And this was a really fun exercise because, in essence, what we found was that the one element of plan design people did understand pretty well were copayments. And we designed a plan that was copayments only. You can think about a copayment as being very analogous to you walk into a store, you pay a price for a good or service. There's no fancy calculation involved. And this is now launched. I think there are, there's about 50 to 60,000 people who have signed up. So we're, we're very interested to see how this goes forward. It really has two interesting features. One is that it's copayment only. The other is that the plan description is very simple and fits on between one to two pages. We've also done a lot of work in trying to think about how do you build incentives that can actually change people's behavior in the context of employers, uh, large employers within the US. And what we did here was to try to take on the problem of smoking. As I mentioned at the outset, uh, as we know, smoking is a huge public health problem. But employers are well situated to try to influence this because they have a lot of channels they can use, including their benefit designs, to try to influence the behavior of their employees. And in, in essence, the problem is, is that about 70% of smokers in the US say they want to quit. About 3% per year are actually able to. And it, it's a sort of a classic procrastination problem where even if a lot of people want to quit smoking, the immediate costs in trying to do that always loom very large because it's very difficult to quit smoking. But the benefits are very distant in time. So it's very natural for a smoker to think, yes, I want to quit, uh, and I'm going to plan to do it next week because this week the, the costs, in essence, outweigh the discounted benefits. Unfortunately, next week it will be easy to come to the same conclusion. So what we were trying to do here was make it more attractive to people to quit smoking in the short term. We randomized people who were employees at GE to either information about smoking cessation benefits uh, programs near their workplace or that same information plus a package of incentives worth $750. And in essence, what we found was we were able to roughly triple smoking cessation rates from about 5% to 14.7%. Based on that, GE implemented a program for all their employees in the US in 2010. More recently, uh, we've been working, and this is work led by my colleague, Scott Halpern, on trying to think about how do we bring the concepts of pre-commitment and deposit contracts into this space. 
And I mentioned earlier on that people tend to be very loss averse. So we know that people uh, respond very well when there's, a, when there's a chance they'll lose money, they will work very hard not to lose that money. And in essence, what we wanted to see here, building on the GE example, was if we gave people an opportunity to put their own money at risk, which they would lose if they were not successful in quitting smoking, but which we would quadruple if they were successful in quitting smoking, was that actually more effective than simply offering to people an equivalent amount of money? Because in essence, what you see as you, as you think about concepts like these pre-commitment or deposit contracts is that effectiveness within the population is really a combination of acceptance and efficacy where the interventions both need to be acceptable and then efficacious among those who accept them. And what we found was interesting. In essence, for populations, uh, so this was, a, I should mention, it was a study of, of about 2,500 employees of CVS. We randomized people of five arms, uh, information about programs, a similar reward structure to what we used at GE, where you would just get money if you met certain milestones, and that was confirmed biochemically uh, as having quit smoking. We also had group rewards that were of similar value. And then we also gave people the opportunity, as I mentioned, to put their own money at risk, which they would forfeit if they weren't successful, but which we would match generally, if, generously if they were. So the first comparison to look at is between the yellow lines and the purple lines, where you can see that you know, we, we, in essence, replicated what we found at GE, uh, nearly a tripling of smoking cessation rates at six months and similar findings at 12 months. However, when you look at the green bar, which is the deposit arm, you see that this group actually did worse than the standard reward arm. And this at first was a little bit of a surprise. But when we looked at unpacking this, what we found was interesting. So among people offered a standard reward, you can see almost everybody accepts this. There's really no reason you wouldn't accept it because you only have a chance to win money. There's no, no potential downside. And among those people, uh, we had 17% quit. Among people offered the opportunity to put their own money at risk, we have much lower acceptance rates, 13.7%. Among those people, we see very high quit rates, 52%. But when you multiply this all out, you end up with a lower quit rate than just offering people a standard gain-based reward. We tried to estimate, all else being equal, for people who are willing to put money down uh, what the quit rate would be. And we, th we think it would be higher among people who are willing to put deposits down. And one of the exciting things about this uh, was that we worked very closely with CVS on trying to think about what does this mean for program design in practice. And coincident with the publication of that study in the New England Journal of Medicine a few weeks ago, CVS issued a press release announcing a new program called 700 Good Reasons to Quit. And the program, in essence, took the findings from the research and, in a much faster way than I've ever been part of, translated them into practice, where they asked us, what should we do? You know, what should we do about the fact that it appears the deposit works really well for people who do it, but most people don't do it? So what we did is we lowered the deposit amount to $50. We increased the match amount to $700. So in essence, it's a 14 to 1 match. And the idea is to make it irresistibly attractive to people who are smokers to do this and participate. And then the hope, of course, is that they will be very successful once they're, once they're in the mix and they don't want to lose this opportunity to get the 14 to 1 match. So CVS launched this nationwide for all their employees in the US June 1st. And we'll be very interested to see how this goes, both in terms of acceptance rates and, uh, more importantly, quit rates among their population. We've also done a lot of work with other kinds of concepts. And this is some, an example of some work we've done uh, on weight loss. We've had a number of studies we've done on weight loss, and this is just an example I wanted to share with you, where, in essence, we've tried to take some of these same principles and think about how to design them uh, in such a way that really lend themselves to trying to help people lose weight. In this case, we randomized people to either a daily lottery or a deposit contract where they'd put their own money at risk. They'd forfeit if they weren't successful. We'd double it if they were. 
And what we found here was that both the lotteries and deposit contracts were much more successful in helping people reach their goals. About 50% of people reached a goal weight loss of a pound a week compared to about 10% in the control group. Social incentives are another very promising area. This is some work that my colleague Judith Long led where we randomized people with poorly controlled diabetes to a peer mentoring system versus an incentive. And what I, th I think was interesting about the peer mentoring system is in essence, she took people who used to have poor control of diabetes and now have good control and paired them with people who still have poor control and just created a mechanism for social altruism to work and for people to help each other. And in this case, it was more effective than, than the incentive uh, itself. So part of why this is important is from a public policy standpoint, one of the provisions of the Affordable Care Act, Section 2705, allows employers in the US now to provide up to 30 to 50% of health insurance premiums as penalties or rewards based on smoking status, body mass index, blood pressure, cholesterol. It can be up to 50% if they include smoking, up to 30% if not. And our concern is a lot of these programs, as they're being implemented, it comes back to the points I was making earlier about standard economics. A lot of employers are assuming, let's just adjust premiums and everything else will take care of itself. And we're pretty sure that that's not going to have the impact that a lot of public health people would like. But there are a lot of other approaches that could be used here uh, that I think really tie into the underlying behavioral principles and would make these programs more effective at improving health. So I want to conclude by just talking a little bit about the implications of all of this in terms of chronic disease management. And I mentioned the shifts in health financing that I think are going to propel uh, much greater interest in the healthcare provider community and trying to figure out how to keep people healthy as opposed to treating them when they get sick. But the underlying challenge here is that if you're a patient with chronic disease, even multiple chronic diseases, and you see a doctor 20 times a year, each of those visits might have 10 minutes of face time. So you have three or four hours a year in front of a doctor, 5,000 plus waking hours where you're on your own. And doctors tend not to have tools to help you improve your health behavior. They don't really know what you're doing uh, and don't really have good ways to help you. So the key thing here is that the proliferation of wireless devices really creates enormous opportunities to think about how chronic diseases might be managed in the future, uh, really leveraging the advances in technology, but I think also very importantly, tying into advances in behavioral science to figure out how do we take the high risk, not all that engaged patient uh, and help them get more engaged in their health in a way that, that will be likely to reduce their future risk. The way we've thought about this at Penn is with a, a program we've developed with support from the National Institute of Aging we call the Way to Health. And in essence, what we do is we take wireless devices of various kinds, and the, the only key uh, characteristic here is we try to find devices which can passively upload data because that's really essential in terms of long-term engagement. These could be scales, blood pressure cuffs, glucometers, um, uh, Fitbit pedometers, medication adherence monitors, they upload data to a server and then depending on what sort of research program people are in, the device will push back uh, information to people either by text, by email, by interactive voice recording. It can go to the patient, him or herself, to a social supporter, it can be a friend or family member, it can go to a peer mentor through an exception handling process, it can go to a clinician, and then for people who are in financial incentive programs, we can transfer funds to people electronically. And I want to highlight two things about this. One is that scale is really impossible without technology. But on the other hand, technology is useless if it doesn't modify behavior. And many of the high-risk patients for whom this would make the most economic sense at baseline aren't very engaged. So we really have to think about how do we bring together an understanding of behavior, the new possibilities created by technology to really drive scalable behavior change. So this is what this looks like under the hood. Uh, and I, I'm not going to go through the complexity of this other than to say it's complex under the hood, but what the end user, what the patient sees is really just that glow cap on the top left. 
uh, and then various push vehicles we use to communicate with them. I also want to highlight to you, though, that the technology itself uh, really creates enormous opportunities, but as I mentioned, by itself, it's not sufficient. So this is an example of a study we did among patients with poorly controlled diabetes. We gave them free wireless glucometers, blood pressure cuffs, just ask them to use them every day, and your doctor's office is going to help manage your blood sugar and blood pressure. And what you see over time is that in the control group that's just asked to do this every day, there's a st steady attrition in terms of the rate at which people do it. It's about 50% of the time after three months, about 30% of the time after six months. But the two groups that were given different kinds of daily lotteries did this 80 to 85% of the time, and that was associated with better glycemic control because then we had a feedback loop that could work. Here's another example of how we're doing this. This is with support from CMS through the Innovation Center. And it's really uh, addressing the issue of medication adherence after heart attacks, where we know that despite uh, lots and lots of good clinical trial data on the efficacy of cardiovascular medicines and reducing morbidity and mortality, adherence rates for patients after a heart attack are incredibly poor. Uh, even among insured patients, they tend to be about 40 to 45 percent in the first year following a heart attack. And in essence, what CMS wants us to do here is to really take on the challenge of achieving the triple aim, uh, in particular improving health outcomes and trying to reduce costs. And, they, and so they asked us, in essence, to put together these types of compound interventions. These are not as scientifically parsimonious as, as what we would probably uh, be inclined to send to NIH, but we're basically parceling together a group of different interventions here, each of which has some supporting evidence to try to come up with a com compound intervention that we think will be more effective. And we give all patients who have had heart attacks wireless pill bottles for their cardiovascular medicines, daily lottery type incentives, a social incentive in which each friend or family member they identify gets notified if they miss two doses of any of their cardiovascular medicines. If they miss four doses, we have a clinical social worker call the patient, call the friend or family member, and in essence creates an early warning system that we hope will be much more effective at, at catching uh, people before they get sick and have to go back to the hospital. And this is being done in partnership with Aetna, Humana, a couple of the Blues plans, Health First, and CMS. We have 1,500 participants in 45 states in the District of Columbia. And so far, uh, the data looks very promising. I mentioned to you the standard uh, adherence in this realm is about 45% among insured patients. And so far, we're seeing adherence rates of about 80 85%. So we're very encouraged by that. We won't know what the impact is yet uh, on hospitalization rates, procedure rates, until we look at the claims data. And we're waiting to do that, of course, until we're done with the trial. So we have a lot of different studies in the field, many of which are being supported by NIH, uh, trying to figure out how do we take these concepts of using wireless devices and behavioral economics to improve health, uh, both in the context of smoking cessation, weight loss, improving the capabilities of medical homes, and uh, I think very importantly in the context of medication adherence because that's often a final common pathway for chronic disease management where we think these types of approaches could be very helpful. But in essence, this is where we think things are going. So if we look back to 2014, much of care delivery within the US is embedded within a reactive visit-based model of, of delivering treatments. Healthcare financing has been based predominantly on fee-for-service, and providers have relatively little data to guide decision-making outside of their offices. The limited telemonitoring that exists consists of giving patients devices and, and hoping they'll use them. And where we think things are heading, and a lot of this may happen fairly quickly, is to a model that is much more proactive and which relies much less on seeing people in doctor's offices as opposed to uh, addressing their needs remotely. And how fast this will happen, a lot of it really depends on how health financing shifts in terms of bearing risk for populations and how quickly that happens. But as it happens, we expect that there'll be a lot of use of various kinds of wireless devices that will be used to give automated feedback both to patients and to their providers. Uh, and where we think 
these types of behavioral economic strategies are going to be very important because the health and economic opportunity often rests in those patients who are not doing that well under the current system. So with that, um, let me thank you again. I, I'm very, very honored to have a chance to uh, be here today. And thank you again for all of your support.